Welcome everyone to another gathering of the family of the Lakeside Community Presbyterian Church over the internet. I'm Michael McKnight, the Director of Outreach. Like the rest of you, I really wish we could be doing this face to face here in the sanctuary, but I also realize that this is the best option given our current COVID conditions. I would like to call attention to the carnicopia on the communion table. If it feels like you may have seen something like this before, you have. This arrangement is a tradition to celebrate Betty Hartung's birthday, which would have been this week. As you're aware, one of our other long-standing traditions has been to allow people to donate poinsettias to remember or honor people in their lives. Many of these plants were then delivered to special members of our church family. Since we are unlikely to have an in-person church service during the Advent season, and since many of the people who used to receive the flowers live in facilities that would not be able to get them, we will be revising this tradition slightly. Starting immediately, we will be, take, we will be taking donations for 10 poinsettias, which will cover the sanctuary during that time. You will be able to do them just like you have in the past in honor or in remembrance of somebody and we will include those in the sanctuary service, but we will only be doing 10 so that we will make sure that we have some people that those poinsettias can brighten up their lives. If you are watching this on Sunday afternoon, this afternoon at 2 p.m., we're hoping that there's gonna be a whole lot of activity in our parking lot. As the family of Jean Angus celebrates her life with the Stock the Shelves drive-through food drive, which will be benefiting the Lakeside Help Center. Jean would appreciate any non-perishable food donations or donations of socks, men's clothes, gently used clothing, and blankets. The family will also have a basket where you could drop off a card with a remembrance of Jean that the family will be able to share. And you can talk about all the impact that this remarkable lady has had on so many of our lives. We are also very sorry to receive the resignation of our longtime organist, Reginald Warren. Due to health issues, Reggie has decided to move down to New Orleans to be with family. If you have a note or a card that you would like to send to him, send it over to the church office, and as soon as we get his new address, we will make sure that we forward those on to him. We have one more week for our Christmas in November drive, which asks for donations so that we can send a Christmas present to the five missionary families that we support. We would really like to make that donation or each gift at least $250. Right now, if we can collect $245 during this coming week, we will be able to do that. And for those of you that remember the new program that is on our website for making donations, if you use the tab called Missionaries, you can actually make the donation right there. Speaking of Christmas, I know that many of you give gift cards as Christmas presents. Our church offers gift cards from hundreds, literally hundreds of stores through the Script gift card program. This year, 50% of our commission is going to be going into the property upgrade account, which is gonna start off with the remodeling of the bathroom that's in the narthex to make it ADA compliant. So if you're interested in seeing what cards are available, contact the church office. We can get you a list of the hundreds of stores but you do need to have your orders in by a week from Monday so that we can get you those cards that very next week. There's another place that is great for Christmas presents, and that's the Prayer Quilt Ministries Annual Fall Festival. You can go ahead and see those items on our website, but remember that the last day of the sale is December 5th, and the sooner that you go in there, the better the selection is going to be. Speaking of the Prayer Quilt Ministries, these ladies were able to work with the military outreach ministries and with the donations from members in our congregation so that we are going to be providing 52 families military families with a complete thanksgiving dinner i would just like to say kudos to all of you that helped make this possible our adult sunday school is continuing to meet on sundays they're switching back to their time of 11 o'clock if you are interested, we will be doing it this week. However, the week of Thanksgiving, we will not be having the adult Sunday school that week. If you're interested in this class, which is studying Handel's Messiah, you can go onto the website and you can get the link to join the Zoom class. We would love to see more people on that class. You do not have to be a Bible scholar by any means to join this class. 
We love the questions from, coming from everybody. Even though we may be virtual during the holiday season, we're still gonna be maintaining some of our traditions, including the lighting of the Advent candles each week during Advent. Whether you have a family group or a group of friends, please consider signing up to participate on this holiday tradition. Just contact the church office. If you want more information about any of these items, check the weekly e-blast or call the church office. Now that we've taken care of the, all of the concerns of our earthly walk, let's prepare ourselves for this special time of worship. Let's tune out all the distractions of the world and get ready for a special time with the creator of the universe. <laughs> And now let us be called to worship with these words. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, who has blessed us with every blessing that comes from heaven, who knew you and chose you before the world began, who loves you so much that he calls you his children, who has brought you from darkness into light and filled you with his power, who has prepared an inheritance for you that will never spoil or fade, who encourages and strengthens you in every good deed and word, who comforts you in troubles so that you can comfort others. This is our God, the ultimate source of all things, the one whom we live and love. Let us worship God together. And now let's sing to him.
would you pray with me? Lord, we praise you for your amazing power and work that is in our, our lives. We praise you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. We praise and thank you for all that you bring to us, for the hope that you give, even in the midst of troubling times. We praise and thank you for your great love and care for us. And we praise and thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you are always looking out for us and that your goodness overflows into our lives and out into the world. And for that, we give you praise and honor and glory. Amen. Amen. So as we come to this time of confession, a time where we lift up our, our words of, of sorrow to God, we um, are reminded on a regular basis that this is something that we are to do. It should happen on a daily basis, but sometimes I know that I forget. And so having this reminder in our lives on a weekly basis is a good step in saying that we need to confess our sins to our God and to the people around us each and every day. So join me, there's a prayer of confession that's printed in your uh, bulletin. If you want to join along in that, you can, or listen to these words as we confess our sins to God. Gracious God, you have given us so much, but too often we take those gifts for granted, or as something to which we are entitled. You call us to live in caring community with others, but too often we place our wants and needs first, with the needs of others a distant second. You call us to share your gifts with the world around us, but we are worried that there may not be enough and our worrying gets in the way of sharing. For all the times that we have mistreated and misused your gifts, for all the times we assume that, we, that what we get is, what we, is ours, forgive us and lead us back to our, your truth and your ways. And so now in these times of silence, offer your own personal prayers of confession to God.
Lord, we've offered up our prayers corporately. And Lord, we have offered up our personal prayers of confession to you. Lord, we truly are sorry for the ways that we have mistreated you and mistreated those around us. Forgive us, for we want to be your people. Amen. Now hear these words from the psalmist that say, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my inequity, and cleanse me from my sin. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that your sins are forgiven. Amen. I was reminded uh, this past week that we are live in unprecedented times, times in which uh, no other time in history have we faced the things that we are facing today. Um, you go back to 1918, 1929, and 1968, and those were uh, important events or things that were going on in the, the, our, our, our country's history. A flu, uh, a depression, and then racial strife. And all of those things have been happening in this year of 2020. And so as we come to a time of prayer this morning, I want to be reminded of kind of those three big things that are going on in our lives right now. Uh, health concerns, and then financial concerns, and really relational concerns with one another and with our neighbors. And so as I guide us through prayer, it's going to be kind of focused on those three uh, broad areas. Uh, so join me now in prayer and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we come to you now and ask that you would help us in the midst of all that is going on in our world. We come to this time of year where we are going to give thanks and we're going to gather in, on, around tables in a smaller setting, but during that time on Thursday, we will give thanks. But as we think back to this year, we think it is hard. It's hard to be reminded that we are to give thanks in the midst of all the stress and the strife and the hurt. Lord, we think of, first of all, of the pandemic and the illnesses and the loss of life that have taken place because of it. And so Lord, we ask that you would be with those that are suffering because of the coronavirus. But also, Lord, we ask that you'd be with those that are hurting and suffering because of a variety of different illnesses. It could be related to a cold. It could be related to something bigger, cancer. But Lord, we know that you will be in the midst of that. Lord, we know that you will be the great physician that can heal. And so Lord, we do ask for healing of those who are suffering with either mild uh, ailments or something bigger. Lord, we also ask for those that are going through trying times as they're awaiting the results of tests or going through therapies. Lord, heal them make them whole again. We ask that for others. We ask that for our own lives. Lord, we also do think of this year as being a year of financial calamity, time, a time where we are uncertain of what's going to happen. For some of us, uh, we have lost jobs. For others, we're uncertain about the future of our jobs. And so, Lord, we wonder what's going to happen next. But Lord, you are a God who knows every step and knows what's going on in our lives. And so, Lord, be with us. May we trust in you for our finances, for the resources that we need to get along in life. Lord, be with those that are suffering and hurting and don't know what's next in regard to their finances. And so, Lord, we ask that you would provide for them. Lord, we also do ask for those that have much, that they would be willing to give to those that are hurting. Lord, we also do want to be a people who are praying for relationships. This has been a year in which... Uh, we are reminded that 
relationships between those of a different color or socioeconomic uh, level are hurting. And so, Lord, we ask that you'd be with our brothers and sisters that are hurting. We ask, Lord, that we might be reconcilers in our lives, that we might help those that are different than us. And so, Lord, be with those that are hurting because of what has uh, been highlighted this past year. Lord, may we be a people who are reconciling one another. May we step across lines that um, aren't, aren't always the, the way that we think that we should, that aren't normal ways in which we do. And may we do that with love and concern. Lord, we also want to be reminded that you are a God who is the God of this church, that we are your disciples. And we want to not only be your disciples, but we want to make more disciples. And that means we step out of our comfort zones and tell others about what it means to be loved by you and to be your disciple. And as your disciples, hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture is from Luke 17, verses 11 through 18, and I'm reading from my uh, New International uh, Version. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you whole. Thank you, God, for this reading. Thank you, Joy, for doing that. And let me offer a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you'd be with us as we have heard your word. And our prayer this morning is that you would speak to us. So, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our Lord and our God. Amen. Well, there were 10 of them that were living just outside of the village gates. 10 of them that probably lived with discarded blankets, bedding that wouldn't have been used by many anymore. There was a, a shelter that was there, kind of like a lean-to with some sticks. It kept the, the cold winds uh, from the desert harming them in the midst of the, uh, in the outskirts. There were 10 of them who lived there, 10 who were out, outcasts, 10 who had been removed from their family, 10 who only received uh, mercy and kindness from strangers. And it wasn't that long ago that they probably were productive people in their village. Maybe one of them was a merchant who sold goods daily at the market. Maybe another, a day laborer, laborer who went out into the fields and worked the fields. Or maybe one was a, a seamstress who sewed things. 
But now, because of their illness, because of their disease, they could no longer do the things that supported themselves and their families, and they were confined to what we would have called a homeless encampment. They each had contracted leprosy through the contact of someone else who had had that disease, and because of this, they were now excluded from normal life. No longer could they be with their family, their friends, provide for themselves. They no longer could live normal lives. And that's the scene that we can imagine was taking place back in the first century as Jesus encounters these 10 lepers in the Gospel of Luke. Now, Jesus was walking with his disciples from Galilee toward Jerusalem. And it's this encounter with these 10 lepers that we learn something about how we need to be thankful people and how we experience God's grace and the response to that. But let me set the scene for this simple encounter of Jesus with the 10 lepers. And let me first give some background information. Now, leprosy was an ailment that was assigned to a variety of diseases, but in its worst form, it was greatly feared and very contagious. Does that sound familiar? The disease attacks the nervous, uh, nerves under the skin and can cause disfiguring of a body. Today, leprosy is known as Hansen's disease, and it still affects about 5 million people around the world. But in the first century Palestine, the only defense for this type of disease was to be placed in a quarantine. So those who suffered from lep leprosy were banished to the outside uh, of a village or a town. Uh, they were confined only to live with others that suffered with this disease. And the only thing that they could do to provide for themselves was to beg, to beg for alms. And then out of someone's mercy in their giving, they would be able to provide for themselves. Now, sufferers of leprosy were forbidden to approach people, um, even to enter into a town or a village. And they were to shout out, unclean, unclean. And so people would stay away from them. And it probably was not uncommon for young boys to be throwing rocks at them and to uh, kind of look down at them. So not only were the, the lepers suffering physically, they were suffering emotionally, psychologically, socially, and spiritually. They were forbidden to come into contact with others. I remember back in my uh, seminary days, uh, I was a, a hospital chaplain at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in LA. And um, during my time of being that chaplain uh, throughout the summer, I encountered a variety of different patients. Uh, there were some that were recovering from surgeries, and there were others that were awaiting tests or test results. Uh, some were there not knowing what was next. Uh, but as a, a clergy, as a chaplain in the hospital, I was ever able to go into people's rooms and to pray with them and to talk with them. But during that time, back in the 80s, uh, our country was still trying to figure out and understand the AIDS virus. So if a patient was suffering from AIDS and the complications of AIDS, they were placed in isolation. And no one could go and visit them uh, except for the doctors and nurses, no family members, no friends. But I, as a clergy, could gown up and go inside the room and visit with these men that were suffering from AIDS. And it was somewhat like the lepers of the first century. I would walk in, gowned up, and they would love it that I was there talking with them, praying with them. And I, I do think it was somewhat like what these lepers were experiencing back in the first century. They were isolated and they were suffering. Now you can understand how much suffering these lepers were encountering and how removed they were from society because as we read the passage, and in different versions it has different things, but it says that both Jews and foreigners or Jews and Samaritans were in the same encampment. Now remember back in those days, the Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Um, it goes back a long ways, back to 722 BC when... Uh, the Israelites, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians. And what they did back then was they exported some of the people. They took into captivity some of the, the Jews and took them to Assyria. And then some of the Assyrians were placed into uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. 
And as that happened, there was about 27,000 uh, Israelites that were taken away and taken to Assyria, probably the same number imported into the region of Samaria. And so these non-Jewish immigrants intermingled with the Jewish people. And over time, some of the customs, both religious and uh, just everyday customs, intermingled with the Jews and the pagan uh, way of doing things. And so you can read about the real discord in Ezra 4. It occurred when the Samaritans had, uh, came, uh, some, some of the Samaritans, so those people who had intermingled with the Assyrians, came to the priest Ezra in 450 BC, and they wanted to uh, be a part of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans wanted to help in that, but Ezra refused their help. They had mortgaged their inheritance, he says, and by getting uh, mixed up with those pagan uh, religious practices and intermarrying with non-Jews, they were now excluded from the Jewish uh, temple and for, from the Jewish people. So the Jews kept their worship of God in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans developed their own set of worship in Samaria at Mount Gerizim. And they had their own set of Jewish laws, uh, own book of Moses, and the hatred between these two races continued to grow and grow and grow all the way up to the days of Jesus. And that's why we read so much of the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. So even though the Jews and the foreigners, the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another, they were co-mingled in this leper encampment that was outside of the village. Now, the lepers in our narrative do the lawful thing. They keep their distance from Jesus and his disciples. They cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus hears their request. But instead of approaching them, instead of touching them, which Jesus did many times, he says, go. You are healed. And now go show yourselves to the priests. Now, why would Jesus say, go and show yourselves to the priests? Well, the Jewish priests of the first century were not only the spiritual leaders of uh, a town or a village, they were also kind of the, the health inspectors. Um, the priests would certify that someone was healthy or cured, and as they would do that, they would say, and now go and give alms or make a sacrifice so that you are purified, not only physically, but spiritually as well. So the lepers, even before they have been cured, by faith, act on Jesus' words, and they go. And it was in their going, as they moved from one spot to another, that the leprosy disappeared. Now, we don't know if it was one step toward the, toward, um, the town, or if it was 25 steps, but in the midst of their going, one of the lepers turns around and comes back and kneels at Jesus' feet and praises God, I'm healed. Now, Jesus acknowledges that this foreigner, this Samaritan, comes back. But he wonders, why didn't the other nine come back? It was only the foreigner, the Samaritan, who came back and gave thanks and glory to God. Have the others no social graces? Did they not understand that you're supposed to say thank you for something that, uh, when someone has shown mercy to them? But Luke tells us that each of the ten lepers had a faith, and they were all healed, but only that one leper came back and had faith and gratitude. And not only was he healed physically, but it seems like he was also healed spiritually. It also tells us that, um, that, that Jesus healed him physically and spiritually. It also tells us that this new kingdom that Jesus was been, has been talking about to the people, to his disciples, it's a kingdom that is for all both Jews and Gentiles. God's grace is available to all. So what does this mean for us? What does this acknowledgement by a Samaritan leper teach us? I think it has some spiritual and practical implications when we give thanks, authentic, genuine thanks that comes naturally from a God-changed heart. So first, by saying thank you, we acknowledge the gift of grace in our lives. By saying thank you, we acknowledge the gift of grace in our lives. Jesus' healing of the ten lepers was a gracious gift. It wasn't deserved. It wasn't earned. Jesus graciously gave these ten lepers new life. 
but only one paused long enough to acknowledge the gift. In our lives, it's important for us to pause long enough to acknowledge gracious gifts in our lives. And gracious gifts come both small and large. Someone passes you the salt and pepper at the dinner table, and you say, thank you. It's an acknowledgement, be it a small one, but it's an acknowledgement that of, gra of a gracious act by that person. We receive a birthday gift, and we sit down and we write a thank you note, or at least that's what we're supposed to do. I know sometimes I kind of procrastinate and take a long time to get those thank yous out, out. but it's important for us to write those thank yous and to do the, those thank yous to the person who gave us a gift, pausing, saying thank you, writing a thank you note, puts things in perspective and acknowledges the gift of grace in our lives. In a book by John Claypool entitled The Tracks of a Fellow Struggler, he writes about the horror of losing his 10-year-old daughter to leukemia. A couple of years have passed and he is reflecting on that and he writes about her death. And he says these words, at least it makes things bearable when I remember that Laura Lou was a gift, pure and simple, something I neither earned nor deserved nor had a right to. And when I remember that the appropriate response to a gift, even when it's taken away, is gratitude, I'm better able to thank, try and thank God that I was given her in the first place. The way of gratitude does not alleviate the pain, but it somehow puts some light around the darkness and build strength to begin to move on. Saying thank you for gifts, both small and large, acknowledges our lives are grace filled. Second, by saying thank you, we acknowledge the giver of grace. By saying thank you, we acknowledge the giver of grace. The leper who, who turned back and said thank you to Jesus was acknowledging that Jesus was the instigator of that healing. By pausing and saying thank you, we are acknowledging that someone has done something, some kind of gracious act for us. A supervisor gives us the day off because we have a child sick at home, and we say thank you. On the playground, a friend stands up for us when a bully tries to cut into line and she tries to make her way uh, to be at the front of the line. And we say, thanks for sticking up for me. A colleague sides with you in a losing battle in an office conference room. And we say, thanks for sticking up for me, even though I didn't get what I wanted. But each of those acts, those small acknowledgements, reminds that person that they have given us grace and we respond back by saying, thank you. It's an indebtedness that we do. Now saying please and thank you is the beginning of a list of human courtesies that go beyond just proper manners. Keeping a secret earns trust. Not taking another person's stuff respects their property. Being on time respects someone uh, else's time. Treating elders with respect honors those who have nurtured us. Responding to a dinner invitation or a party is being considerate of others' plans. At the heart of courtesy is showing respect, respect for others, and then ultimately the bigger picture of showing respect to God. Finally, by saying thank you, we are helping to build community and our dependence upon each other. By saying thank you, we are helping to build community and our dependence upon each other. Someone sends me a gift, and I pause long enough to say thank you, I'm reminded that I wouldn't have that gift unless that person graciously had given me something. It acknowledges my dependence upon them. I, don't, I couldn't have had this gift without them, and we have a connection. It's something, uh, somewhat of a, a, a spiral effect. A mother bends down to her child that's in a crib and gives that, that little baby a little rattler. And the baby coos back at that mom and gives a little smile. And then the mom just picks up the baby and embraces the baby and gives it a bigger hug and a kiss. There's that spiralness of gratitude and thankfulness. The kiss is even greater than the little rattle that was given. And it expresses greater joy. A joy that began with just this small little act. 
When I was at Irvine Presbyterian Church, I had the privilege of leading Vesper services at a local retirement community. And in the assisted living area where I'd go once a month to uh, lead a little Vesper service, each time I would go, I would make a point of expressing, saying thank you for coming to each of the residents that were at this little Vesper service. There was probably about 10 that were in the room. And so I would say, thank you for coming. And they would respond back and say, oh no, thank you for coming. And so we would have this little dialogue back and forth. And there were times throughout the year where someone wouldn't be able to come to the Vesper service. Maybe they were ill, they were out running an errand. Some even passed away. But when someone was missing, there was a sense of loss. That sense of community that we had had over the months uh, was lost when someone was gone. And as we, uh, I had that bit of, of, of sorrow when I didn't see someone. As you and I encounter each other, as we exchange pleasantries, as we say, thanks for coming, or we say, uh, say thanks for, for being a part of the party that I had, that thank you begins a dialogue with that person and it grows into an interdependence of one another. In the bigger scheme of life, saying thanks to God acknowledges our interdependency upon him, the ultimate giver of grace in our world. So as we pause to give thank you this week, I want you to remember this story, but also the principles that are behind it. A word of thanks acknowledges the gift of grace in our lives. A word of thanks acknowledges the giver of grace in our life. A word of thanks helps to build community with one another and an interdependence upon others. I have one little exercise that I want you to do. And you have to print it out if you're at home. Um, the, in the, 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 the worship order that we sent out, one of the attachments, has this sheet of pumpkins. And they're just little blank pumpkins that are on there. But what I want you to do is to cut out the, a pumpkin and I want you to, to write a word of gratitude or thanks to God on that pumpkin. And then what I want you to do is to take that pumpkin and put it in a place that's going to remind you to give thanks. So maybe it's in the bathroom, maybe it's in the car, maybe it's in your office cubicle. But you're going to take that little pumpkin that you cut out, write a, words of, of gratitude on it, and then stick it somewhere that's going to remind you again of that, that, that time, of, of, of the the gratitude or the, the gift of gratitude that has been given to you. And so it's just a little act. Another way, another thing you could do is pass it around your small gathering uh, on Thanksgiving and have everyone write something before you have the meal of something they're thankful for. Go around the, the table sharing that and then give thanks to God for that. So as this week, as we go and gather, we know it's going to be a smaller, smaller gathering but, and we may feel more isolated. We're not going to see loved ones that we really would like to be with this year. But we still can give thanks, especially at this time of year. We need to give thanks and make that a sacred moment of giving thanks and pausing and saying thanks to God for what he has given to us because he is the ultimate giver of grace in our lives. With that, let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for this time for this time of year, and especially for this story, because it reminds us of the kind of God that you are, a God who is a giver of grace, abundant grace, grace that overflows into our lives, and our response needs to be thanks. Our words of gratitude need to be expressed to you in big and small ways for the ways that you have given us so much in our lives. So Lord, be with us. May we do that today. May we do that throughout this week. May we do this as we are gathered around tables and giving thanks. For you are indeed a God who gives graciously and mercifully in our lives. Amen.
I placed something else in the bulletin this week, and it's the passing of the peace. I don't know if it's been a tradition around here or not, but one of the things of the, in, the, in the church down through the centuries, it's, it's a time where we pause and, and pass the peace of Christ to one another. And even though we are not gathered together as God's people in a worship setting, we're out in the community, we're out in the world watching this on, on our computer screens or our TV screens. And I wanna encourage you to pass that peace to someone else. So all I'm asking is just to say hi to someone else. So during this time, if you wanna text someone, if you wanna call someone, I wanna encourage you to do that. And maybe you're gonna wait till after we're done with the worship service to do that. But I wanna encourage you the pass, to pass the peace of Christ to one another. And we do so with joy and thanksgiving. Now, Liam, let me invite Joy forward to uh, give us our, our call for the tithes and offerings. I feel nice. I need to be down there, but I don't have a microphone down there. Um, my name is Joy Ray, and I have been a member of this church for almost 50 years now. Uh, I'm one of the old timers now. So many of our old timers are gone on to be with the Father. Um, I don't know who our oldest members are now, but I'll have to check our record books and, and see uh, what that looks like. This week I have a wonderful um, Thanksgiving and gratitude. I met my husband 50 years ago on November 13th when he came to work in my office. And for that, I'm very grateful. We'll never celebrate a 50th anniversary, but we have at least 50 years of friendship now. Um, we have four children, five grandchildren, and three grand, great-grands. And I am so thankful for all of them as well as for all of you. I am also very thankful for this church, its history, and what it's done in this community. This church will be 150 years old in three years. I just realized that when I was checking on the date, 1893. We have a wonderful opportunity to praise God and a wonderful opportunity to be thankful in three years. We'll have to have a great event. Um, we have had two wonderful pastors in the years that I have been here, Ted Roberts and Bob Menzies, each having spent more than 30 years in this uh, church, in this congregation. Um, since Pastor Bob and uh, Van Elliott retired a couple of years ago. Um, we have also been fortunate to have Pastor Randy Yenter and Alan Duell as our interim pastors. I am so thankful for both of them for helping us and with all of you who have worked diligently to keep our congregation together and praising God. Um, and now we're just so thankful to be able to welcome uh, Pastor Tim Abasia to our congregation. And now for our dedication. First of all, we mentioned last week our church family did a great job of giving in the month of October. So, as October 31st, we had spent less than $5,000 than we, no, we spent less than $5,000 that we received so far in 2020. Hope that came out well. We hope that you will continue your great financial support throughout November and December so we can actually end up in the black. We are particularly grateful that even when we are not able to gather as a church on site, Many of you are finding ways to uh, get your donations to the church. This now includes a new option on our webpage. I'm gonna check this out myself. 
uh, if you go to contact tab on the top of lakesidepc.org, there is a give tab. Checking on this tab will bring you to a new safe and secure program for making your donations. You can make one-time donations or you can set up a recur recurring donation. There are tabs to specify whether the money is for general giving or specify if some of it goes to the Deacon Fund or our missionaries, Christmas in November or maybe Christmas joy offering. If you have any questions, contact the office. As you can see in front of me, um, we have uh, many people have turned in their time and talent sheets and their pledge cards. Thank you to everyone who has done that. We encourage the rest of you to do so at your very earliest convenience. Now you, will you please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, even though we often forget to show it, we are grateful for the gifts you have given each of us, including our abilities and talents. Today, we are not dedicating pieces of paper called time and talent sheets, but instead, we are offering you our thanks for our abilities and are making a vow to do a better job of making these abilities for your glory, using it for your glory. Similarly, these pledge cards are not just pieces of paper, nor contracts, but instead they represent our gratefulness for the financial resources that you have given us. They also represent how anticipating we anticipate being able to support our church financially. We are also dedicating the tithes and offerings that have been given to you this week. Help us as a church to be good financial stewards of your gifts and use them always to do your will and to spread the good news throughout our community, our country, and our world. Help us to make every decision based on how we glorify you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So as we conclude our worship service, there's an invitation and a blessing. The invitation is this, that this is the week in which we are being reminded that we need to be thankful, that we need to say thanks to one another, thanks to God for the gifts of grace and mercy that are in our lives. They're big, they're small, but acknowledging the giver of grace in our lives is important for us to do. And so now receive the, be, uh, the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the, our God give you peace from this generation to the next and the next. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.